Hello, VC. It's your friend Roger. Um, wow, I have over a hundred subscribers. That is just astonishing. Uh, I want to thank, thank each and every one of you who watches my videos. Uh, I can't believe um, folks find it interesting. Um, uh, I want to thank Chris John Coltrane 68 uh, for the shout out this morning. That's really super sweet. Um, yeah, um, this place is awesome. Um, I want to thank um, Derek for inviting me to the uh, Facebook page. That's been a lot of fun. Um, but anyway, wow, 100, 100 subscribers and counting. Um, so you know what that means. It means a contest. Uh, I've got a good topic, I think, and um, some good prizes that I want to give away. Uh, it's going to be cool, so I'm going to announce that tomorrow. It's a holiday here in the U.S. Um, the irony of which calling it Labor Day does not escape me. But anyway, yeah, I'm going to have a contest, so tune in tomorrow, and I'll uh, set you up on that. Thank you all so much. Cheers. So yeah, the Facebook page is pretty lively. Uh, it's a lot of fun to see, you know, you know more incredible records, of course. Uh, but, you know, how uh, you know, people's listening rooms, their record rooms, uh, getting to know folks. Um, you know, I'm new here, I'm trying to, you know, I really want to get to know you all. Um, so I'm going to have a contest tomorrow. Um, but anyway, on the Facebook page, <clears throat> there was uh, some discussion about Sun Ra. People were selling some Sun Ra records. I showed a couple of mine. Uh, I'm way into Sun Ra. Uh, Blake uh, Words DB made a comment on one of my earlier videos about you know being being an expert on something. Well, it's a good thing uh, he used those scare quotes because I'm no expert. Um, I've loved his music for a long time, but as you know, you all know, he's made a lot of records. Um, this guy's an expert, Robert L. Campbell. This is the first edition of his discography. It came out in 1994. And you can see it's a uh, it's a rather slender volume. It has all the um, the known uh, official releases in it. But he attempted to really document every every gig, every live recording, every audience tape, every. And so, in around two thousand one or something, he put out the second edition. Uh, has a lot of corrections also from the first edition. Um, is now, of course, way out of date. Lots more stuff has surfaced since then. Um, I started writing about Sun Ra because just trying to wrap my mind around this stuff, uh, it, it'd be a full-time job. Um, so in the 90s, when Evidence put out all these CDs of some of those rare Saturn records, uh, it was like a revelation. You know, this stuff, Sunrise music was impossible to find. These Delmark releases, uh, blue legs of the ZSP things were around, but you know, to hear this stuff, finally, it's great. I'm listening to some of it right now. I'm going to show you the vinyl of these two records. This is two records on one set. Um, but the problem with these, is that it's the 90s and digital technology is really exciting and so they kind of overdo it with the noise reduction, they kind of overdo it with the compression, trying to make it sound better. And they really kind of make it sound just futzed with, to my ears. Uh, they're fine, really. If you see these around, I think they're going out of print. Um, cool thing is the discographical information on these, uh, Professor Campbell, uh, contributed to this, so it's correct. The original Saturns were no notorious for wrong information on the jackets. Um, so when I show you these records, remember, don't go by what the record cover says. 
Uh, so anyway, uh, around 2010, I remember seeing uh, these Saturn, you know, these titles reissued on vinyl at the record store. And I'd been burned before on bootlegs. Somehow I've been widely bootlegged. Um, so I, I, I didn't go for them. Uh, and then recently, I discovered that, you know, the Saturn label was putting out stuff that had never been released, reissued before. I was like, well, I gotta check that out, and I did, and it sounded really good. So I checked out a few more things that had um, previously been reissued on like, Atavistic, taken from Needle Drops. The LPs appear to be taken from tape. Turns out, El Saturn, the Chicago El Saturn, was purchased by, or is administered now by Universal. These, so these are legit vinyl reissues. So wow, I, you know, I had to get them. Sure enough, stuff that Evidence had put out, it sounds kind of messed with. These sound like, you know, the tape, warts and all. Cool, right? Um, so I'm going to show you these. There's 24 of them. So this could be kind of a long video. Please bear, bear with me. I think you'll find it interesting. Um, they're reasonably priced. Um, I've paid anywhere from 12 to like $18 a piece for them. They're pressed on 180 gram vinyl, nice heavyweight jackets. But one caveat. Out of 24, I had to return two because they were unplayably warped. Another handful are warped to a varying degree, but play, okay. And the rest are fine, sound fantastic. So, you know, much like the Sun, the Saturn originals, there are, there are pressing issues. But I figure for the price, considering how rare these original Saturns would be, you know, it's worth buying multiple copies till I get the perfect one, in my estimation. Um, they seem to go in and out of print. Um, just like the old Saturn label, I think they press up a couple hundred, and they sell out, they press some more. Uh, I just got an email from Forced Exposure, uh, Art Forms of Dimensions Tomorrow, just been repressed. Um, I didn't have trouble tracking all these down in a few months. So, the records. The records are so cool. Um, so yes, Sunny, uh, Wound up in Chicago, worked with some doo-wop groups, uh, formed the El Saturn label, uh, his partner Alton Abraham, 1955, to put out singles. Eventually made uh, some records with the orchestra and then it just went from there. So one of the things about Sun Ra, he was innovative in so many ways. He uh, was one of the first jazz guys to play electronic instruments and play them in a really interesting way. Uh, he was one of the first um, you know, artists, you know, musicians to adopt a whole new persona, you know, long before Prince. You know, he was an upsetter long before Lee Scratch Perry. Um, and he started his own label and did the DIY thing, you know, long before punk. You know. uh, Charles Mingus started a label around 1955, but it didn't, maybe it was even a little bit later, but it didn't last long, you know. Uh, Sunrock well continued to put out records on El Saturn to the end of his life. You know, there's a schism between him and Alton Abraham in the mid 70s, late 70s. Um, and so there's the Chicago Saturns, and then there's the so called Philadelphia Saturns that somehow put out himself. Those are even more rare. You know, hundreds, thousands of dollars a pop I've seen them sell on eBay. So, yeah, while originals would be awesome, they have that talismanic power, some raw. Many of them was hand screen covers, you know. Yeah, that would be awesome. But out of my, out of my league. So these reissues are pretty nice. Caveats aside. So first, from uh, 1956, Supersonic Jazz. Uh, you know, by this time he had a, a band that had coalesced around him, John Gilmore. Tenor saxophonist, amazing tenor saxophonist. Marshall Allen, uh, alto saxophonist, also played flute, Nobo. Gilmore also played some amazing bass clarinet. Um, Danny Davis, another saxophone player. Pat Patrick, baritone sax player. Uh, the father of Deval Patrick, the governor of Massachusetts, or whatever that's worth. Uh, and 
you know, his crazy persona, um, whatever you make of it, it inspired this intense loyalty from particularly this core of Reed players that stayed with him the rest of his life. Uh, so he's got a pretty killer band here, uh, playing uh, mostly, uh, yeah, all original music. Uh, this is very much in the vein of his first record, Jazz by Sun Ra, which was later reissued as um, Sun Song of Delmark. Um, you know, swinging big band, um, but with little quirks like, you know, electric piano or a uh, weird harmony. Um, beautiful, I mean, very accessible, uh, a classic. Uh, along those lines, there's also uh, sound song, Pleasure. Kind of hard to see here with the glare. Uh, this is from 1958. That's a great back cover. Uh, this was reissued by Impulse in uh, 1974 with a different cover. Uh, so again, this is uh, very much in that swing and vein, um, but uh, doing like standards, like uh, Around Midnight, You Never Told Me That You Care with a uh, vocalist. Um, and the first appearance of a raw song, Enlightened, became a staple of the repertoire. It's one of the cool things about Sun Ra, you know, it wasn't just instrumental music, and when they were singing, it wasn't like jazz singing, it was, there were songs. There was almost a pop sensibility to it. And almost, uh, you know, he was old enough, he was in his 40s by the time he was making these uh, first Saturn records. Uh, he had a pre-war rhythmic sensibility. It's kind of unusual. Even as weird as it sometimes got, he still had that uh, um, roots in the tradition. Um, cheers. So this is a wonderful record. Sun Ra, what is it called? Sun Ra and his Solar Orchestra, Orchestra Visits Planet Earth. Great cover. Um, it's recorded from 56 to 58, but it's um, more of it, he's moving in a more interesting compositional direction here. Uh, with uh, overtones of China, has you know has sort of Orientalism thing happening here. Uh, reflections in blue gives his weirdly updated version of the blues. Um, Saturn, which is this awesome atonal post-bop thing, this crazy two-octave range. Uh, it's killer John Gilmore on this. Um, uh, next, from 58-59, uh, this is recorded, uh, The Nubians of Plutonia. A great cover. There's uh, Marshall Allen on the back. Um, this was also reissued by um, Impulse in 1974 with a different cover. Um, this is, you know, again, he's moving in that sort of spacey, space jazz kind of thing. Touches of exotica and um, tribal sort of drummings and stuff. Um, you know, he's playing electric piano and it's, it's, uh, it's beautiful stuff. I love this stuff. Um, it's starting to get weird though. Um, this one's kind of a mixed bag, uh, Angels and Demons of Play, uh, recorded anywhere from 56 to 1960, various times and locations. Uh, all that info on the jacket is totally misleading. If you really want to know what's what, you got to consult Dr. Kim. Um, you know, again, he's like, he's, um, redoes Medicine for a Nightmare in a little more aggressive kind of way. Uh, band is just kicking at this point. And his compositions, uh, he's really starting to come into his own compositional and playing and composing for these specific musicians. Um, uh, beautiful record. Um, to really know what's going on, you gotta, you gotta do the research. But uh, Another beautiful 
record. I, I love this period of Sun Ra's music. Um, we travel the space waves. Uh, again, this is recorded various times from 1956 to 1960. Um, edited and put together by Sun Ra, who was, um, you know, amazing at editing and sequencing an album. Um, these are just, they're just perfect. Um, another great one. Now we're into like 1959, 1960, sort of. Little, Last period with uh, where he was in Chicago. Um, you know, I don't even know what to say about this stuff. It's just you. Uh, so yeah, the last, those last few records, he's he's moving in a more abstract. He's finding his voice as a composer. Um, getting kind of away from that swing thing of the earlier records to uh, the rhythm is more flexible, it's more danceable, it's more, it's great stuff. Uh, but then in 1960 he puts this out, Holiday for Soul Dance, well, I don't know when did this come out, I'm not sure, it was recorded in 1960. And it's back to that big band swing of those earlier records, his first LPs. Um, and again, it's uh, it's a lot of standards, uh, but the vibe on this is just so joyous. The band is so tight, and you know it's not like they're going through the motions playing this hoary old repertoire. They're like they're feeling it. You know, again, that Sun Ra's connection to the tradition was imbued on the musicians who you know surrounded him. And so this is just a straight ahead swing and jazz thing, and you know, anyone would love it. You know, maybe a little weirdness here and there, but um, just, you just can't, you know, if you love jazz, even the most trad jazz, you, you're gonna love this. Totally great. So, 1960, end of 1960, he, um, Leave Chicago to go play a gig in Montreal, or maybe it was supposed to be an extended stay in Montreal. That kind of fell through, and he, they, um, him and you know the orchestra traveled to New York. I think maybe they were promised a gig with him in New York. Well, Ronnie Boykin's, they, you know, the bass player, his car broke down, leaving them stranded basically in New York. Uh, I think some of them split, went back home to Chicago, but the, those core musicians, you know, including Boykin's. Um, state and um, you know they were poverty stricken there was no work I think they lived in a squat on the Lower East Side um, but Tommy Hunter drummer you know, had connections and so um, he's able to get them into this building that housed the uh, what's called the choreographer's workshop in New York uh, it was on 51st Street so, so you know it was a ballet studio it was a piano lots of space for musicians he could use it after hours, nice reverberant acoustics. And he made a bunch of records at the choreographer's workshop. Hunter had gotten an Ampex reel to reel, um, was the master of knowing where to put that little one microphone to capture a nice balance. Uh, and also discovered that if you uh, plug the output back into the input, you get this echo effect. Um, and he's in real time manipulating these echo things. It's really trippy, amazing stuff. You know, it's lo-fi, but it's this magical kind of lo-fi. You know, again, so innovative. He was lo-fi before Guided by Voices. This is maybe my favorite period of Sun Ra's fast discography because of the sound of the choreographer's workshop and the vibe. There, you know, there's no work. They're just rehearsing. They're just like they're working on the music and on themselves, and there's just. There's just a magical quality to this stuff. So, uh, the first one, Fate in a Pleasant Mood. This is from uh, 1960. I'm getting ahead of myself. I think this is actually a Chicago record. I think this is the last Chicago record, Fate in a Pleasant Mood. Um, I'm sorry. See, I, I even have notes. I can't keep this in my head. It's too many, it's too many records. 
Sorry, Fade in a Pleasant Mood, 1960, still in Chicago. Uh, beautiful record. Again, he's moving back out into either more abstract stuff, more electronics. Uh, Kingdom of Thunder is this incredible electronics display from Sun Ra. Um, great record. So, okay, now we get to the choreographer's workshop and stuff. Excuse me. So, 1961, Bad and Beautiful. They made one record for Savoy right when they first got there, um, Futuristic Sounds of Sun Ra. It's a cool record. This is kind of in that vein. Um, again, a smaller band because, you know, these are the ones who stuck around. Beautiful stuff. Just, I love this choreographer's workshop. Art Forms for Dimensions Tomorrow, uh, recorded 61, 62 era, at uh, the choreographer's workshop. Don't pay attention to what it says in the back. Um, these are some leftover tracks from Bad and Beautiful sessions um, and some early experiments in um, what he called guided improvisations. So I'm going to talk about more detail in a second. Uh, another classic, Cosmic Tones for Mental Therapy. This is uh, 1963. Look at that cover, it's awesome. Uh, again, recorded at the choreographer's workshop, has this great vibe. Uh, that title, you know, it's not an idle pun. Uh, Samra had been an earlier experimenter with um, music therapy, what we now call music therapy. And um, th in no way is this some sort of new age pabble. This is way out there. One of my favorite records. Just, there's nothing quite like it in the entire massive discography. Cosmic Tones for Mental Therapy. We all could use it right now. Uh, another great record from the Choreographer's Workshop uh, When the Sun Comes Out. Uh, this is again 1963. Uh, not as out there as uh, Cosmic Tones for Mental Therapy. Uh, it's, it's more of that sort of space groove kind of stuff. Just beautiful. Look at that great cover with him in the space helmet or something. He might have been crazy, but he knew what he was doing. A lot of genius. Completely nuts. Um, and so this record, Continuation, this. Uh, just recently came out. Uh, had long been out of print. Really, really rare original. And it came out originally in 1970. And so, for the longest time, people thought this was 68, maybe. Couldn't really tell. Um, and I wrote about it on the blog. I was like, ah, this has got to be earlier than 68. This is. Uh, and I even speculated, you know. That sure sounds like the choreographer's workshop to me. Uh, I forgot to grab it, but there's a CD that recently came out, same time as this came out this year. Two CDs, continuation, and then a whole disc of outtakes, and uh, it confirms that, in fact, this was recorded at the Choreographer's Workshop in 1963. <laughs> wow. Uh, this is more in the vein of um, Cosmic Tones. Pretty out there, pretty weird. Um, Great Gilmore playing. Um, yeah, I've seen this in the stores. You should grab it. It's a weird one, but excellent. So, um, so yeah, guided improvisation. Sun, Sun Ra had, was suspicious of the whole free jazz thing. You know, he used to say things like, uh, you'll be free when you're dead. Uh, this planet is about discipline. He wrote 100 compositions with the title Discipline. Discipline 1, Discipline 27, Discipline 27 2, Discipline 99. Um, so Sun Ra's approach to free jazz um, is disciplined. Um, and this is his first uh, extended uh, uh, group improvisation. Other planes are there. This is 1964. 
This is the last choreographer's workshop recording. Uh, side long title track, other plans there. Uh, 22 minutes uh, of improvisation, but Sun Ra is guiding what's going on from the piano, either by cues or at this point, you know, these musicians, he could look at them and they would know exactly what to do. I mean, the, the telepathic communication that's going on is really pretty extraordinary. And it, you know, this is not, this is as ambitious as uh, Ornette Coleman's Free Jazz or Coltrane's Ascension, um, but it's not that high energy anything goes kind of thing. This is this borders on an almost chamber music quality and um, sound effects and um, yeah there's some great soloing stuff but it's it's all it's Sun Ra's music. It's um, unmistakably Sun Ra's music. This isn't just some free free-for-all. Classic. Uh, Excuse me. Uh, similarly, the uh, the Magic City. This is from 1965. Another sidelong guided improvisation. Incredible. Now this is around the period of his ESP records, Heliocentric Worlds. Um, nothing is a live record. If you like that stuff, oh boy, you're gonna love these these records. Um, electronics. Uh, some of that marimba action going on. Excellent, excellent record. Uh, and then we get one of the weirdest records of all, you know, really weird discography. So, it's saying something. Strange Strings, <laughs> aptly titled. Uh, Sun Ra had collected all these weird toy instruments and exotic, you know, kodos and violins and weird stringed instruments, handed them out to the band and said, play. Called it a uh, exercise in ignorance. And it is wild. It is one of my favorites. I mean, but it's it's intense and out and um, like nothing you've ever heard. Uh, then in 1966 he put out his first, he didn't Make too many solo piano records, but this was his first monorails and satellites. Uh, it's probably recorded um, the House of Raw on the Lower East Side. And uh, while he was capable of virtuosity, that's not what's happening here. This is him thinking through, you know, his musical conception at the keyboard, uh, abstract and ruminative, uh, beautiful, uh, but not some, it's not a recital or something like that, so it's a cool record. Uh, there's a volume two, it's never been reissued, uh, original Saturns of volume two go for hundreds, hundreds of books. Um, so this is an interesting record. Atlantis. Uh, one side, the title track, another side long title track was recorded live uh, in New York in 1967. And it's mostly an extended electric organ solo by Sun Ra. And uh, it's, it is wild. It is, it's, I guess, the first example of his sort of mad scientist incredible. He's got this cheesy, 67, right? So he's got this cheesy for Fiza or some Gibson Kalamazoo or something. And he's attacking that thing um, in an apocalyptic fashion. And um, that sort of thing would become sort of a regular aspect of his live shows. Um, but in 67, that must have blown some minds. Uh, the second side features his experiments with the Honer Clavinet funky little reedy instrument that Stevie Wonder popularized with superstition. Um, and it's cool, um, sort of percussion grooves and him quacking on the um, clavinet. Another classic record. Um, so yeah, 
one of the innovative things about Sun Ra was his early adoption of electric keyboards and the interesting things he did with them. So in 1970, he uh, got access to a uh, prototype of a mini moon, uh, two of them, in fact. He went into Variety Studios in New York and made two albums. Uh, My Brother the Wind, Volume 1, another great cover. Uh, so this one, Volume 1, it's, uh, he brought a couple of other musicians with him. John Gilmore, who mostly plays drums. Marshall Allen plays oboe, piccolo, flute. Danny Davis who also plays drums from Gilmore solos. Uh, but it's mostly Sun Ra experimenting with these two uh, mini moogs. And he plays the mini moog like no one else. Um, he worked with a guy in the studio, I didn't write down his name, uh, for getting these various sounds. And it's. Um, It's otherworldly, really, what it is. You know, it's proof that maybe, maybe he did come from Saturn. Great record, not available on CD. Uh, and then there's My Brother the Wind, Volume Two. Um, side one is more synthesizer stuff, uh, but side two uh, features the first appearance of June Tyson, uh, vocalist. Having a female vocalist in the orchestra really changed the vibe in a good way, I think. Um, she stayed with them until her death. She was great. She sounds great on here. Uh, someone described this kind of stuff as space age barbecue music. Someone was on this funky organ and they're chugling. She's singing. Walking on the moon. You know, right after the moon landing. It's, uh, it's just joyous stuff. You know? So one side, weird synthesizer experiments. Other side, uh, Space Age Barbecue. Great record. Uh, we're getting there, folks. Uh, now we come to one of my favorite records of all time by anyone. The Night of the Purple Moon. Uh, this is from 1970. Uh, sorry, My Brother the Wind, Volume 1, was recorded in 69. Volume 2, 1970. This is also 1970. Uh, he's got the mood going, but he's also got another weird keyboard. He's got the EMI Rocks Accord. Just again, this primitive, cheesy, buzzing thing. You know? One of the amazing things about Sun Ra is he could take the cheesiest keyboards, you know, the kind of thing that would just sound ridiculous in anyone else's hands. And he turns it into uh, you know, a, a whole orchestra of sounds. Incredible. Uh, this record again is another small group with uh, John Gilmore mostly on drums. And uh, it's just got a great vibe. It's kind of mellow, it's kind of floating grooves, and Sun Ra's doing his thing. Again, thinking, thinking through his conception of music right there on the keyboard with this crazy sound. And it works. It just, I love this record. Um, CD on Atavistics taken from a needle drop. This is obviously from tape. It sounds great. Um, let me jump ahead to another iconic cover. I think this was on the cover of Rolling Stone. This is from 1971, Universe in Blue. Great cover. Uh, this was recorded live uh, around August 1971, and again, it's his take on the blues. Um, you know, Derek, I know you've talked a lot about the blues, and I really don't like it. I, w I wonder what you, what you think of Sun Ra's take on the blues, because it's, it's so sophisticated and um, uplifting, you know, it's not... It's not the blues the way most people do. It's it's still it's Sun Ra. It's beautiful. Gilmore sounds so incredible on this. Um, again, not on CD. Kind of a rough recording, live recording, but great, great record. Last one, and we leap ahead to 1977. This is one of the last Chicago Saturns that came out, I think. 
Soul Vibrations of Man. That's a great cover. All this insane text on the back. Some, uh, and the music is uh, its a good reflection of what's going on on the cover. It's um, wild. Another live recording. Not great sound quality, but okay. First side has these two pieces that's just for flute choirs. Oops. Uh, side two features a killer version of the Shadow World, this fiendishly difficult composition. You know, it goes by like that because, you know, it's like 300 beats per minute. And then it's a string of out solos. John Gilmore, you know, um, mid 60s, John Coltrane went to John Gilmore uh, looking for lessons. Uh, John Gilmore was a master. He could have been a star in his own right. Uh, made a few records outside of the orchestra, uh, but he always returned. And uh, an incredible player. Okay, sorry that took so long. There's a lot of records. Uh, all of them worth looking out for. Um, I hope. This has been enjoyable and useful information for you. I will be back tomorrow with my 100 subscribers contest. Stay tuned. I'll see you soon.